In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Neil Patel, co-founder of Crazy Egg and Kiss Metrics. He also helps companies like Amazon, NBC, and much more grow their revenue. He talks about some of the big mistakes he made. He talks about some of the low points, and he talks about some of the things he did to help grow companies to generate millions of dollars. That and much more coming up now. founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges and mistakes in their life and business, so we can also. Today I'm talking to Neil Patel. He's a co-founder of Crazy Egg and Kiss Metrics. He helps companies like Amazon, NBC, GM, and HP grow their revenue. Neil, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I want to give a brief introduction for people who may know you or may not know you. Um, just because I want to get into the biggest things, which is what we can learn from you about big mistakes, big challenges you've worked through. Now, a couple of Neil's companies he started and co-founded with Heaton Shaw. 2002, Neil co-founded Advantage Consulting Services, an SEO company. Um, in 2006, they co-founded Crazy Egg, which has helped over 50,000 companies grow their business. It's helped and it helps determine what visitors are doing on your site. In 2008, they co-founded Kismetrics, a customer analytics platform. It signed on more than 2,000 paying customers. Neil also runs Quick Sprout, which shares valuable ways he generates traffic and much more. Neil, I also would like to include a fun fact about something. Before we get into those big lessons, mistakes, what's a fun fact about you that most people don't know? Because you blog all the time. You said this is your third interview today. What's something most people don't know about you personally? Uh, I only have five really close friends that really? are my age. I preface it with my age. I have a lot of friends, but I have five really close non-business friends, mm-hmm. right? Because oh, the majority of my friends are actually in business, but like we party together, we have a lot of fun. So everyone always sees the business side, but people don't really see the partying fun side. And I kind of go crazy for at least a few days out of the month. So what's your big big vice when you have fun? What do you like to do? We just party really hard. <laughs> really? So nothing crazy like the hangover, but it gets, sometimes it gets bad. They, use you, they lose you in an elevator shaft or something. I haven't had to lose an elevator shaft. We've lost each other before, right? Uh, we've almost got arrested. Haven't got arrested yet, but like... I had, a, I had to stop a few fights one time at the Wynn Hotel with some of my buddies, but we've done some fun stuff. So tell me this, you know, what's been, you know, obviously you've grown and run successful companies. What's been a painful moment? What's been a low point for you? Sure. The lowest point I ever had in my entrepreneurial career was when I was around 21. Started a company called Vision Web Hosting. We really talk about it. And what ended up happening was we met some guys in Texas. Right, and these people, I first paid them to help create a website. They failed at creating a website, right? Then I had them create a web analytics web counter site. I launched it, it sucked and it had a lot of bugs. Then I decided I want to really get into business with them after they screwed up twice, right? And then we launched a hosting company, kind of like the grid server, right, by Media Temple, in which we we're going to take a cluster of servers, combine them, and then sites would sit on all the servers. So that way you can have a more load. And the finances and the economics work out better. But I was a naive kid. So instead of using a co-location, I didn't think about co-location literally until the day we shut down. We bought a home. We put servers in a home. We had the electricity company drive more power into the home. Wow. We had extra ACs. We had backup generators. We, put, we had them dig fiber optics and put it into the home as well. Not the smartest thing to do. It would have been so much cheaper just to use a co-location. Next thing you know, after a few years, we were uh, in the hole over a million bucks. Wow. So why so, did you decide to start a hosting company in the first place? I was silly. I had ADD. I tried to do a bit of everything. I still have some of that tendencies and problems right now. But that was a big reason. And that was probably the lowest point. Because when you're 21... 
and you made decent money revenue wise, but you've burned more than what you made, it ends up being like, crap, why have I, what am I doing? I'm just like wasting all my time. And a million bucks to pay back in borrowed money it wasn't investor money. It's very hard to pay it back because in California, there's taxes, right? State income tax. And then there's federal. So let's say you want to pay back a million bucks. At that time, the taxes were a bit lower, but you would have to roughly make $2 million, pay taxes, you'd be left with a million, right. and then you pay back people. It's not easy making two million bucks. When you're 21, you don't think about making two million bucks. Because I'm a realistic person, and I was like, what's the chances of me making two million bucks? And I'm a business partner, so it'd be a million each. But you get what I mean. Like, right. that's very unrealistic. It's painful. Very painful. So where do you start to get out of that, that hole when you are in that debt? I just keep working. I didn't know what else to do. My parents are like, don't worry. We'll figure it out. My parents aren't rich. And, um, you know, luckily it was a lot of family brought money, some from my parents, my business partner, he then put up a lot of his personal money. So no one was like, you have to give us our money right away. Yeah. But we made it work and we paid it off really fast. So it was good. So how do you curb that ADD? Like there's certain times we need to focus. I find myself getting into that uh, sometimes too. And I hear that is really common. How do you curb it? I've made so many mistakes with the ADD that I now know, like, only do this business. So for example, my buddy has this realtor that he does like seminars and coaching for. So in the first month they did 50,000 bucks in revenue, very little expenses. I think they spent like 6,000 bucks in expenses. And he's like, dude, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Right? He's like, I'm 50% sure I just have him buy, buy me out. And I was gonna get on the call with the guy and my buddy I was going to be like, all right, what's involved in this business? How many hours does it take? What do you think you can get it to? And I was going to analyze the numbers and actually see if the growth could actually happen. And I would have bought the 50%, let's say I give him 10 grand, right, instead of six. So he would have been happy. But I would have made back my money in less than a month or two. But at the end of the day, like I was actually thinking about this deal this morning and yesterday, right? Because it came up yesterday. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's not right for me. Why? Because I need to just focus on my core business, right? 50 grand or 50% of that would be 25 grand. There'd be some cost. So let's say 20 grand in profit, 15 if you want to be conservative. So 15 a month, you know, over a course of a year, it's not bad. It's what, like what, 186? Something like that, right? So at the end, or 180. Um, at the end of the day, what I quickly learned was I shouldn't focus on what other people are doing, the opportunities out there, I just need to focus on my own business. And I used to jump through all these businesses and keep going from one to the next. I used to treat them as buses, right? I'm like, oh, they're always passing you by. Let's jump on to the next one. So now what I do is I'm just like, oh, I don't need to do it. I don't need the extra money. Let's focus on the core business. But it took me many years to get there. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think I've necessarily solved it 100%. I'm probably three, four X better than what I was before. But on a scale of if you had to do one through a hundred, I think I'm around eighty percent there. I have twenty percent more to go. But it's slowly getting there, and I think the only solution for me was time, learning from mistakes, and just experience. Other people have told me countlessly, "Hey, just focus on one business, focus on one business." But I've always had that problem. Right. It's easier, you know. You you know logically that makes sense, but when something like that comes up, and you're like, "This is a good opportunity," is there a past? mistake that you that just is burned into your memory that you think of that you know if you think of that one memory that you will not get you know uh, you'll stay focused there isn't one memory but i remember when we were doing the consulting company if i focused on the consulting company instead of doing crazy egg or kiss metrics the consulting company would have been a lot better bigger but would have made me a lot more money i hated it so i'm happy i got out but it would have been bigger mm -hmm. You know, now, if I did a transition from Crazy Egg to Kissmetrics, Crazy Egg would have been much bigger. A lot bigger, right? Uh, I think it would have been worth over 100 million bucks by now. Huh. So, and then Kissmetrics, I haven't transitioned to anything else after it. So I've learned my mistakes slowly. It just takes me quite a while. And in between all of those, there's a lot of businesses where I've thrown money at, right? Like Fruitcast, we were the first podcast advertising company. Think of Google AdWords, but for podcast advertising. That didn't work. The hosting company didn't work. We had another one called Cyplimp, which was an easy pay-per-click management solution. That didn't work. 
But if you look at all these things that I've tested, just so many things out there and literally most of them fail. I just need to focus. And when I focus on one business, I do pretty well. It's easier said than done. When I was, I was watching something with you talk about Fruitcast, why, I would think that's a good idea. Why didn't that work? Because there's a lot of podcasters out there. Uh, bad business partner. Oh. So the guy at that time, his heart wasn't into it. So me and Heath and my other co-founder, we put money into it. We, Heath and I always do everything together. So we were putting money into a lot of random things, and we didn't realize the value of people. Like, we had Yahoo knocking on our door for Fruitcast. But when you have a guy who's running, he's like, yeah, I don't want to work anywhere. I just want to do my own thing. But yet you invested in it. Like, it kind of blows. What do you do, right? Mm -hmm. So that was probably one of the main reasons Fruitcast failed. Plus, the pricing model was really off. You can't charge people a dollar a listen. Every time they listen to ad in a podcast, charge them a buck. That's expensive, right? Even like 10 cents is expensive. So we eventually had to figure out what to do with a lot of these businesses and just close them off. But like even my partner, he has ADD problems too, right? And say with me, his is not as bad as mine. But we both like investing in companies. Um, we both like being advisor to a lot of companies. And both of us have slowly cut that off, right? Like I've learned, don't invest in other companies. The best company to invest in is yourself. I've learned at least my business partner still enjoys advising and that's fine, that's his passion. Um, with me, I'm not as good as he is when it comes to advising because I'm bad at picking companies. Like he has a talent for spotting like good companies that are going to do well. Um, he's like a visionary, right? And with me, I, I suck at it. So what I need to do is just focus on my core business because I know I'm really good when I invest in myself. And what inspired me to do all of this is Elon Musk. So I was watching an interview with him one day, or not with him, but of him. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and Elon was talking about how he doesn't try to do too many things, doesn't really care to invest, doesn't do like a lot of advisor stuff. He's like, I just focus on my core business. And I'm like, if you look at all the people who are really successful, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and like the list continues on, most of these guys just focus on one core business and don't do anything else, right? Yeah. I'm not saying I'm going to be as successful as them, but I'm slowly trying to learn from them. Yeah. So what's been a proud accomplishment? One thing when you look back that you're amazed that you accomplished? So it's weird in which I'm not that amazed or proud of anything I've done. But my parents, looking at it from their perspective, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. are. Because it's like when I talk to my dad or my mom, like, we never expected our kids to come this far. Because my sister married my business partner, Heathen, right? That's how I met my sister. I mean, that's how I met Heathen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about it, like, both me and my sister have our homes paid off. We don't have mortgages. We, neither of us have car payments. Like, life's not bad. We're not the richest people out there, but we don't really struggle. We don't really have to worry about any bills. Both our parents are retired, so we don't have to worry about, you know, mom and dad having to make some income. We'll support them, although they've done fine on their own. But... It's kind of amazing, right? How many people can say they're 28 years old from my parents' perspective and be like, yeah, my kid just doesn't even have a home. He has, he uh, bought it with cash. I bought another one with cash and I recently sold it in less than three months. But not too many people can do a lot of those kind of things. And I'm kind of lost in this world. It's kind of like a wonderland due to the fact that I'm poor compared to my friends. So when I look at some of my friends, they're sitting on a few hundred million bucks or half a billion dollars. Like, I'm really poor compared to them, right? So I see their lifestyles and everything I do, it seems really tiny. But when you look at it from an outsider standpoint, if you take an average Joe, I do quite well compared to the average Joe, right? So from that standpoint, I'm still amazed because you can't plan financial success. Sure, you can do well by working hard, but a lot of it, right, making millions and millions, it's, it's a hit or miss in many cases. So, and I think making the first million is the hardest, but getting up there in the multi-million level, like, it really starts becoming a lot of it luck with right timing, right place, so forth and so on. Yeah, I mean, you put yourself in that position, though. I wouldn't say it's all luck, but I'm, I think I've heard Bill Gates say that as well, but I don't know if I agree with that. It's not all luck, but a large part of it is luck, right? right? Luck and hard work. Yeah. Um, it was funny, I was talking to my co-founder, Heath, and a few days ago, 
and we're talking about Sujinin single grain and we're analyzing how he's done well. I told him this is pretty public and he's done well. And we were actually trying to break apart what makes someone like him not do as well as he actually does quite well. And uh, we help him out. I wish him the best of luck. But the sacrifice. So most people, including Sujin, although he's done well, he's not willing to sacrifice as much. And he knows it. He like wants, with what? Like lifestyle. So Heath and I will sacrifice family, life, everything for business. And I'm not saying it's right. Sujin has a much better balance, and I think he has a much healthier life due to it, right? But Heath and I have sacrificed so much to get to where we are, and I think that's what most people forget. Heath leaves early in the morning and comes back late. He works his butt off. And the beautiful part about my sister, she accepts it, and she's like, you go make the bacon, go do what you love, and she's involved in the business, and she kicks butt herself, right? She runs crazy. Without her, it wouldn't be as big as it is today. But the thing that most people forget is you really got to make the sacrifices and most people are willing to make them and it can affect your personal life in a very negative way or family life or whatever you want to call it. Right. And that's yeah. what most people are willing to sacrifice. Yeah. yeah. So where does the inner drive come from to start companies? What were some of the influences as a child that you have? Yeah, it's probably, so most people think it's my mom because my mom is a businesswoman and I love my mom to death. And it's probably because of her, but it's actually more because of my uncles. So on my mom's side, she has this brother named GM. I call him uh, GM uncle, or in my language, his version. So with him, he owned a lot of homes, uh, lamination business. He worked at Boeing as a full-time job, right? He was an immigrant like my parents. And he kicked butt. He did extremely well for being a first generation, you know, coming into this country. And he just hustled. Nothing ever stopped him, right? He's done like he's touched in a bit of everything. He even does like retirement homes for old folks. So I saw how successful he is. And then there's a lot of doctors in my family. I'm like, I look at the doctors. And I'm like, hey, my uncle G is more successful than them. How? And they're like, oh, he's in business and he's done extremely well. And that's what actually really motivated me, because I wanted to be like him and I wanted to be very successful like he was. My mom also did encourage me. My mom, not so much as you need to be an entrepreneur, nor my dad, neither one really pushed me for that. But I saw my mom, she had that drive, and she just did whatever it takes. And like my mom, I'm not the smartest in books. My mom's smarter than me, right? She's a teacher. But I wasn't the smartest kid in high school or college or anything like that. I didn't get the best scores on my SAT compared to some of my friends who got almost nearly a perfect. But I was smart enough for business and I was hungry enough. And I think a lot of the motivation came from my mom's side of the family. And when you're poor and you're a little kid and you remember the struggles, like my mom walked to school with my sister and I every morning as a teacher and worked for free until they were willing to offer her a job. Wow. And I saw her struggle, and you know, me and my sister were poor eaters. So my mom would save up money and save my dad and get me Taco Bell every once in a while, right? And you think about it, to save money to get Taco Bell, like how much money could you have? And we weren't that bad because we had a great family from like my uncle GM to my dad's side of the family. They gave us a lot of stuff. My mom's, my dad's sister gave us the Oldsmobile that we had. Uh, uncle GM gave us a lot of the furniture we had. I think some of his furniture is still in my parents' home in Orange County, right? But we had a lot of family help, so it wasn't, we didn't struggle that bad. But I remember my parents telling me, like, as a kid, when you're five, six years old, and your parents tell you, like, yeah, we're spending more money than we make each month, and it doesn't really hit you. But when you have to realize that they're to save for Taco Bell, like, it hits you, oh, I can't have Taco Bell whenever I want. So yeah. that's what gave me the drive. My drive was live a better lifestyle and be an entrepreneur to make money. But I didn't realize that making money doesn't necessarily make you happy, but that's why I started my journey. Yeah. So I know that you were a hustler, even from early on, and used to sell vacuum, vacuum cleaners. Tell me some one a story from that, what you learned from uh, going door to door. Sure. So I'll tell you two stories. I only sold one vacuum, right? This, and the first vacuum I sold was to an Indian couple. The husband wasn't home. The driver's like, hey, this is an Indian couple. You're Indian. Go and sell, right? It's your own people. I don't think he knew any better, right? Just because I'm Indian doesn't mean they're going to buy from me. 
ended up buying for me. I convinced her to put a rainbow vacuum and I sold her a Kirby for like sixteen hundred bucks. And this is in a middle class neighborhood. So when homes cost five hundred grand, you're selling a sixteen hundred dollar vacuum. It's not an easy pitch. But I got a sale, and then like a week later, she returned it. So I didn't really get paid any commission. It was a commission only job, so there was no hourly rate. But the thing was, is they would make me go door to door and knock in the heat in Orange County. I had to keep on knocking, and I had to get in there and convince people to let me clean their house for free. One room. I was only supposed to offer one room. And that's what I learned was, you know, which gives me the second story is knocking on doors and never giving up. It's like, I would knock. And if you're just like, oh, no, sorry, no thanks. I'm like, oh, I have a free knife. You don't want a free knife set? When's the last time you, you know, got new knives in your home? And I would just try to keep finding angles to just like, get in there and just like oh i got it i had one person even says like hey if you don't stop bugging me i'm gonna let my dog at you like that's <laughs> how much i just kept that right and i learned actually through the whole process how to upsell so like if i was selling you a vacuum and your home only cost let's say three hundred thousand bucks which is silly of me to do like going into a poor area and i'm trying to sell you a vacuum and you're like i can't afford the vacuum in which many cases in those neighborhoods couldn't and I was like, oh, that's a nice TV. I'm like, do you have cable? They're like, yeah. How much do you pay on your cable, though? I pay 150 bucks. Well, I got a question for you. You know, and this may be a silly question, but what's more important? Your two-year-old daughter over there or that cable TV? They're like, of course, my two-year-old daughter. Well, what was if I told you this vacuum is going to take away the pollen from the air, the the dust mites from the bed, it's going to do a better job cleaning it. NASA, this technology came from NASA, right? And I'm like, would you rather make sure that your daughter doesn't have asthma and doesn't get sick as much, or would you rather have the cable TV? Like, I was using fear to try to sell, like, I would do whatever. And then when I got no, then I learned to upsell. I'm like, well, you know what the funny thing is? I'm like, your house isn't bad, but this one room is really clean compared to the rest of the home. I'm like, would you like me to clean the rest of the home for you? You seem like a great person. You know, I'd love to just help you out. They're like, really, you do that? I'm like, yeah. I was like, you know, I got to make go to more houses and stuff still. But hey, if you can, you know, pay me a bit here and there to clean the rest of your house, I'll gladly do it. And then I started upselling people on just cleaning their home because I found out that it was easier sells than selling the vacuum. And I was already in that clean one room. Or I'll clean half the carpet or area, and I would know they would want the rest. So I was like, I would just start upselling. <laughs> That's smart, actually. You see, like the white part is nice and clean. <laughs> yeah. and that other part's disgusting. Because <laughs> you technically only do one room in a lot of houses. The living room connects to like uh, the dining room, right? And if the dining room has carpet, I wouldn't clean the dining room. I'd just clean the living room. They're like, wait, there's this line. It's not as clean. I'm like, well, I can do the rest for you. Or if you want, you can just call a company to do it. It may take a few weeks and they're going to cost more, right? But I just kept selling. And that's actually the one thing I'm still good at. I never give up. Like I, when it comes to especially sales, I just keep at it until I get what I want. So how do you use that tactic in Crazy Egg and Kismetrics? The I just clean this one room, but I can do the whole thing. So the best example of this is, and I'll give you an example with Kiss Metrics. Mm -hmm. We get you in there, you integrate, it's a free trial, and you love it. And once you're engaged, you're just like, oh crap, my trial's over, I gotta pay. Another example is once you're in your trial, and then, or once you're over your trial and you pay, it's like, oh, I really want this advanced segmentation. For, oh, you didn't sign up for the plan that has it. You want it, you gotta pay more, right? So it's like you get people addicted and then you just keep up selling. It's like what GoDaddy does. But how do you know which features people will want? Because obviously there may be things that you think they'll want, but there's actually what they will pay more for. What were some of the things you did to figure that out? It's through surveying and interviewing. So getting customers to actually give you feedback to surveying them using Qualaroo or SurveyMonkey to figure out what they like, don't like, tracking usage of specific features and applications, right? Doing price testing. Qualaroo has some price testing templates. So all that kind of stuff helps us determine what features to put for free as well as which ones to charge for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Neil, what's a big roadblock that you ran up against? Because you are willing to fight through anything. What's something you ran up against that, and what you did to get through it? Um, I actually haven't talked about this one. I'll let you be the first. All right. 
So I see a smile on your face. Um, so a year and a half ago, maybe two now, Kissmetrics was in a class action lawsuit. Oh. And, uh, you know, that was tough because we were planning on this. We we're thinking about raising more money, but we had a lot of cash in the bank at that point, or we had enough. We would say like almost two million bucks. And we're so close to breaking even, and our burn was so low on a monthly basis that it seemed like we could go years, right, before we actually lose all our money. So at that point in our current growth, rate, I'm like, cool, within, you know, three to six months, we should be at break even. And when you have, like, let's say three years left, you know, three to three months or six months even to break even isn't that big of a deal. But we got hit up with a hit with a class action lawsuit over privacy. And we didn't do a lot of the stuff that the Wired magazine article claimed that we did. But nonetheless, lawyers in America can sue you for whatever they want. And you have insurance. The hard part about it was they hit us and they hit around 20 of our clients, right? So as for an entrepreneur, one of the most important things for me is reputation. I will lose all my money personally to protect me, my business partner, my customers, like I'll go, I'll do whatever it takes because money is just money, right? Your reputation is priceless. And that lasted a year and a half. So I was going through mediation meetings, trying to get it settled. We wanted to settle. The people suing us wanted to settle. Berkshire Hathaway, which was our insurance company, didn't care to settle. They provided us a lawyer. They gave us a shitty lawyer who's probably going to lose the case. We had a great lawyer, uh, Ashley Berger. She just got appointed a uh, tech control article on her. She just uh, joined uh, Facebook at a really high legal position. Um, I think she's under their head counsel, but she's kick ass, right? She's dealt with a lot of our legal stuff. And it's just tough because your customers are getting sued and your customers are calling you like, what the hell? We're using your product and now we're getting sued because of you. And we had a few angry customers. At the end, we got. And then when the people who are suing you are like, hey, we'll let you go for free if you sign this piece of paper saying we can come after all your customers. Now I wasn't willing to do that, right? So I had to deal with it for a year and a half. Um, we got all our customers out of it. They didn't have to spend a dollar other than, you know, if they got a piece of paper in the mail, maybe they wanted to appoint some of their counsels to deal with it. But some didn't even actually appoint any legal counsel because they didn't have to deal with anything because we just took care of it, right? And in the end, we were able to settle and we settled because, you know, our lawyer at that time was trying to say, all right, what's the difference between settling versus fighting? And she's like, I think we can beat this in court because she beat this kind of stuff for Facebook and Apple and a lot of other big companies. And she has a job at Facebook now. So she was like, yeah, the cost to beat this in court. She's like, I'm 97, 98% certain we'll beat this. She's like, I've done it many times. And these guys have always lost to me. And it's over the same exact thing. She's like, it's probably going to cost you a million to 1.5 million, somewhere around there, right? My numbers could be off. I knew it was above a million, under 1.5. And we couldn't afford that. And the insurance company wouldn't pay for legal fees for our own counsel. So, but mm -hmm. if their counsel in there, we would have lost. So we had no choice to settle because settlement is cheaper than fighting in court. I know that sounds funny, but that was the case. So we ended up settling. But that was a tough time in my entrepreneurial career because I've never really dealt with that, right? Like getting hit with the lawsuit and a class action lawsuit where it's, you know, like five lawyers against you, it's never an easy thing. It's really stressful. It's stressful. I've dealt with actually even stressors, more stressful things and worse things than that, but can't always talk about all of them on that. Right. <laughs> it's funny. So that's actually, I think, what makes me a good entrepreneur. It's not that the fact that I'm just a hard worker and I can hustle, but I can handle more stress and higher volumes of it than most people, right? Like, I'm not strong physically. Like, if you tell me to pick up a 40-pound dumbbell, I'll suck at that but I can endure a lot of mental stress. So what do you do? Is there, is there anything you could have done to avoid that? Or was it just, just a bad luck situation? Bad luck, other people have done it before. So the technology that they sued us over, they're saying we are sharing data, which we actually never shared data. We were able to prove that we didn't share data. But the technology was, you put a cookie on your computer and you clear your browser cookies and it's supposed to erase. We did something where it didn't erase. It was a flash cookie, different type of cookie. There's no laws against it. And it saved on our hosting costs by around 30%. So 
So for us, as a startup, when you don't have much money, what do you do? You try to figure out how to save on costs. And if we're like, oh, here's a new technolo technological way to save more money on hosting, when you have a six-figure hosting bill, 30% adds up, right? Yeah. But we didn't think about it as, oh, the government's going to, or not government, but there's no laws against this. The laws that are written for cookie stuff were in the 80s. And at the end of the day, this is the 2000s, right? Like the web's changed a lot. So what do you do? And there's no law saying you can't do it, but we do it because it saves us money and we're a startup. And the people suing us, at first thought we had a lot of money because they see all these big logos on our websites and next thing you know, they're like, oh, you're a startup. Let us see your customers instead of you. So. It's painful. It's painful regardless. Yeah, you live and learn. So what's, you know, what's some of the big mistakes you've made and learned from in, in some of the businesses? If you, like Advantage Consulting Services, you said you hated it. What's one of the big mistakes you made there? Yeah, the big mistake that I made at Advantage Consulting Services was... Uh, I stopped selling when times were good, in which we were growing and building customer base, a big customer base for me speaking at conferences. And then as more revenue came in, I stopped going to conferences because I didn't have as much time because I would have to focus on providing the results to the customers. But what we should have done is built out a sales team, and we didn't do that. And we should have done that. What do you look for in a sales team now that you now you'd probably do that with the other companies? What do you look for in someone? Yeah, we never did. Kiss, uh, we're doing and it's working out well. I look for a good VP of sales because it's something I don't know. <laughs> so I look for someone who's really experienced. You may end up dropping a few hundred thousand to like three, four hundred grand a year on paying someone really good, but it's worth it if they can grow the revenue. Do you look for someone who sells vacuum cleaners? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, like you look for someone who's built out a sales team, who knows mm -hmm. how to hunt, and has done it in a very similar industry. So I typically look for like VP of sales who know how to sell to marketers, get a hold of them on their own without being given leads, and know how to close big ticket items. So that's usually what I look for. Yeah. What about with Crazy Egg? What's a big uh, mistake lesson learned with that? The big one, and we hit it on a bit earlier, is I should have focused on Crazy Egg, just like how we went from ACS to... Crazy Egg to Kissmetrics, I think Crazy would have been a lot further along than it is now. So, you know, live and learn. They're, all companies are doing well. Advantage is no longer around, but Crazy Egg and Kiss are both doing well. So. You would, wish you would have focused more with that one? Yeah. So what about Kissmetrics? Kissmetrics, I wish we would have built a simpler product. Simpler? How Sim so? Uh, the very, you, it's a complicated product. The onboarding experience, everything is very complicated. It's a problem that a lot of people have in our space. Analytics isn't easy because you're trying to have one product that solves problems for every business on the web. Well, the problem is every business has their own issues and problems that you have to solve. So it's hard to create one product that does it in a very simplistic fashion. Due to that, it started becoming a very complicated product. And the product and engineering team who are awesome at KISS, they're actually working at on fixing that, and from the mockups I've seen, there the new version potentially um, is probably going to be really kick-ass. So, is there something there, like from the beginning, that you could have done, or is it just something that you were getting customer feedback, so you created more features? Well, when we started early on, we started developing a really complex product. We should have built a simplistic product. And that we could have done at the beginning, but we didn't learn this kind of stuff until later on. Crazy, it worked extremely well because it's a really simple, simplistic product. It's not that we tried to create a simplistic product. It just happened to be simplistic and we got lucky with it. We didn't learn about this kind of stuff until we created Kissmetrics, which became a complicated product. We're like, wait, why didn't it grow as fast as Crazy when we first launched it, right? Overall, the growth rate is faster, but when we first launched it, and we were just like, oh yeah, people are saying it's complicated. And it's like, ah, oh, I didn't think about that one. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Is Tell me about how the partnership started with Heathen. Yeah, so I was in high school. I gave a, I had my first website. It was called Advice Monkey. And I was trying to figure out how to rank it on Google. And I eventually learned how to do so. Now, I wanted to finish college quicker. And although I wasn't the smartest at school, I was better than probably more than well over 90% in my class, right? So I was going to nighttime college classes when I was a kid and my first speech I gave was on how search engines work. And one of the guys from that classroom decided to hire me. He's like, hey, I'm a sales rep. 
I'm here just brushing up on my sales skills. But I know someone in marketing was looking for some SEO guy, and it seems like you know this. Are you interested in a contracting job? I'm like, yeah, sure. And I forgot the amount that he had originally hired me at, but it was like three thousand five hundred or five thousand a month, something like that, for like ten hours worth of work a month. The results we provided to them were great, right? Made him well over ten million bucks. My number is actually quite a bit higher than that per year, just from the leads we drove. Now, granted, there's additional costs like sales reps product managers, cost of producing the products. But in revenue, we're adding a lot to the bottom line. And what we quickly realized was, was, oh, cool, we're good at this. And the owner, who we were driving a lot of revenue to, he's like, these kids are good at this and they can make people a lot of money. His son owned an ad agency called Tonic LA. And his son introduced us to quite a few more companies, Countrywide, Blue Cross, all these types of companies that could help pay us. And from there, just screw the next thing you know, we're like at 20 grand a month. And you know, it was a bit before that, but when we started getting the revenue really quickly, I was getting these customers trying to call me while I was in class. I'm like, what do I do? I need someone who can, who knows business. And my sister's like, I'm dating someone who's studying business in college. I was like, oh, then he must know business if he's in college studying business, right? He's actually a really smart guy. Uh, but that was my thought process and uh, we ended up partnering up and it was actually a really great partnership and I think with any partnerships it's always hard the first year or two because you're figuring out how each other works but I have to say like none and neither of us think about ever partnering with anyone else as business partners and the reason being is we just know each other so well there's really no fighting we're both really up front with each other we know how to make the company each of our companies grow without stepping on each other's toes. And then with Crazy, we have a third business partner who's actually really awesome as well that we all get along with. His name is John Butler, so he's one of the Crazy Egg founders. But me, Heathen, and John uh, together, we kick butt. So how did you approach Heathen in the beginning? Because it's sort of random. It's your my sister's s- boyfriend. Yeah, my sister introduced us. She's right. like, hey, with Heathen. And but I'm you like, still oh. have to kind of sell him, I want you to do something with me. It was my sister's like, you should partner together. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Right when you're like 16 years old, you don't really think about, hey, I got a partner. How do I do this? You just be like, okay, here's a business partner. You don't think about betting on. And I was lucky because he is a smart person. He's a hard worker. He's scrappy, and he compliments me, which, you know, he understands product development, all these kind of things that I don't understand as well. And I understand business really well as well as he does. I understand sales, a lot of this kind of stuff. So we complement each other really well. And it was a quick sell pitch, like on both ends. Within a minute or two, we were like, all right, we're good to go. Hmm. So what are some things, you know, a lot of people team up with family, brothers, sisters, maybe spouses. What are some things you think people have to watch out for when having a partnership with a close family member? Being up front. So Heath and I are really lucky because we're really upfront with each other. Like we're blunt. Like if I'm like, Heath and you're screwing up, you like effed up here. You'd be like, I did. He's like, how, what processes can we set in place so this kind of stuff never happens again? But it's funny. I don't even have to say, Heathen, you effed up here. Heathen will be like, I effed up here. I should have done this. I need to think this way. And then uh, I'm the same way. I'm like, oh, shit, I should be focusing more of my time on X, Y, and Z. And it was funny. Like, I was talking to Heathen yesterday night, and I was like, dude, guess how many time I spend helping people out on the phone? He's like, how much time? 120 hours a month? They're like, no, not that much. I'm like, 60 hours a month is the amount of time I have phone calls with random people that I don't know, giving them free advice. Not, don't even get a penny for it. Literally 60. I had someone wow. just bust out a spreadsheet, not including interviews or any of that. So I was like, dude, I need to cut this down so I can focus more on business. He's like, yeah, I'm like, shit, I should be doing more for the business, right? Like, if that 60 hours gets me 60 more hours with our businesses, and he's like, totally. But we call each other out on our own stuff. We help each other out. Like, Heathen's very proactive. He's like, I want to help you make Quick Sprout bigger. Very, like, just a kind, good-hearted guy, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll see a company that's a good fit for him. I'm like, dude, you should be advisor to this company. Let me introduce you to CEO. They're pretty big. I'm like, maybe they'll do something with you, right? So it's just we're really transparent with each other. Yeah. And we love working with each other. And, like, I'll always put him first and his interests first over mine. And he always puts my interests over his So works out really well. Yeah, I mean, you seem introspective. Is there anything he's called you out on that actually surprised you? Not really. Um, at the time, sure. And 
looking back at it now, I can't actually even think of something because he used to call me out like years ago. We've been business partners for over 10 years, right? Right. Call me out on anything in like probably over five years. <laughs> and usually when he calls us out or I call us out, it's more like both of us are screwing up. We should have done this. Because in reality, it's a partnership. Nothing's really my fault, nothing is his fault. We'll both take ownership of blame, but we both, like, I'll say I screwed up, and he'll be like, yeah, I should have helped you with that. Or he'll say he screwed up, and I'm like, yeah, I should have thought through that, right? Because although he's saying he screwed up because it was product related on something, it's not his fault only. I'm 50% partner. I should have helped him come up with it. I shouldn't sit mm-hmm. back and just be like, yeah, you do whatever you want. Or like, if I screw up on marketing, right? Because my job is to handle marketing, I have to take the responsibility for it. But Ethan will look at himself. He's like, yeah, I should have told you. I should know this too. Because he knows a lot of marketing about marketing as well, right? So all that kind of stuff is really important. That's powerful advice, actually. You know, taking responsibility. And that I think that goes across the board with relationships or anything. Yep, totally. I, I love that one. I just Thanks. realized. That was a good one, Neil. I like that one. Yeah, no problem at all. I'm like, my bad. I realized the TV's also on, so it's probably getting in the frame. But, oh, Do you well. want to turn it off? Yeah, one minute. So, continue. <laughs> um, I want to find out, again, you seem to be a master of starting companies, generating customers. What's worked for you really well to grow the company that maybe you didn't expect? Um, so I never had that problem because I expected all of them to do well. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, but what worked that I didn't assume that would do well was content marketing. So creating content, goodwill, Mm -hmm. educating the market, people eventually come back to you, even if it's not directly from that page, they'll tell other people how great you are. They'll sign up and rave about your service. And I didn't realize content marketing would be that powerful. I meant something like happened as a mistake. Maybe someone asked you, oh, well, you create this content and then you did and it actually worked, but it wasn't because you thought this grand scheme up. It was just because someone just said something. Usually most things, when people tell you stuff, there's no run real big hit. Maybe there is for other people, but yeah. for me, there never has been. And what I've experienced over the years is you do a lot of little stuff that adds up to something big. Yeah. And there's going to be no grand slam and you always think there's something or one little trick, but yeah. it's usually mm-hmm. a lot of stuff. I was reading your post on infographics. How did, and that's, that's done really well for you and you spent a lot of time, energy and money on it. What made you first start to do infographics? Cause it's not like everyone out there is doing it. What made me start doing infographics was we were seeing how mint.com at that time was killing it from infographics. So we took their model and we just started doing it on our own site. But that's how we came up with that model, is copying mint.com. Got it. So what's a good piece of advice you've gotten from a mentor that's been most valuable for you? Ride the coattails of other people. So a mentor once told me, his name is John, if you know a lot of rich people, let's say if you know 10 people and they're all worth over 100 million bucks and you want to learn how to make more money in business, well, ride their coattails, learn from them. And don't just leech off of them, right? Writing the coattails is probably a bad way to phrase it. But you also have to help them out. Go above and beyond and do more for them and don't expect anything in return. And he's just like, they'll bring you into deals. They'll show you how to make more money. They'll help you for free because you've helped them. And that really does help you grow. That's how I made my first million was helping other people. So what was a specific instance that you remember that his words were ringing in your head and you actually, and what you did? Sure. So um, I went out there and helped one of my buddies with his content site and I helped him get more SEO traffic. He then introduced me to another company that uh, was venture backed at that time. And next thing you know, over a few emails, the dude signed a contract with me for 240,000 bucks. High profit, Mm -hmm. right? Probably made 200 grand in profit just from that one deal. So just from helping him out for free, he's like, yeah, you should uh, talk to my buddy. He should hire you. And that was it. Like, I didn't even have to pitch him hard or anything. Your emails, boom, he was ready to sign the contract. So maybe those 60 hours you should keep doing. I should. (laughs) I'm running into time issues, which is why I started tracking all of this. So how do you know which, I mean, obviously you're not going to cut down all the 60 hours. How do you decide who you actually spend the time with and who you don't? I appreciate you spending the time here, obviously. So the interviews I'll keep. 
right? Because interviews, it's actually very reciprocal in which I'll help your audience, right? And it also helps drive the press for my brand, my companies, whatever it may be. So that I won't remove. Um, and I probably won't remove all 60 hours of just helping people. I don't know yet who I'm going to remove and who I'm not, but it's probably going to be something like if someone really pushes hard to get help from me, then I'll take the time to help them. If they don't care and they just write like a measly sense saying like, help me make more money, I'm going to start ignoring a lot of those people. Because it's like, if you can't write more than a sentence on how, how I can help you, then I shouldn't keep trying to help. Because I actually help those people. I get people like, help me make more money. They're like, give me a phone call, teach me how to make money. And I'll get on the phone and I'll give these guys advice. But I should not try as hard with the people who aren't willing to put in the time and effort. Yeah, and I should try hard. I should still keep giving advice to like those moms. Uh, there was a mom who wanted to start a bed and breakfast. And she's like, hey, I laid out a plan. Here's what I want to do. I'm struggling. I don't have much money. My son isn't willing to help. And he's not doing well in college. And she laid out, he was like, here's some potential options on what I'm thinking. Can you please go through these scenarios and tell me what you think? I got on the phone with her, gave her advice. Like, those are well worth it. I'm not going to cut that off. Yeah. The person who's just like, help me make money. Help me become rich. Like, it's hard. Even when I get on the phone, there's not much I'm really doing. They still love it. But I'm, I just tell them about hard work. You got to solve problems. It's a lot of the same stuff over and over again. Right. I mean, anyone here, one of the things I'm, I'm looking at is, you know, such valuable content. Like, you should sign up for the newsletter. The marketing book is awesome. I mean, it's probably, if someone just reads that in detail, and actually when I was reading through, I was really surprised the idea number 14, which is talk shit. And I was actually like, Neil talks shit about people? So I had to read that one. It's where you call out just some, it's a, I don't know if I'd call it talk shit. It's a good like copywriting line, but it's more you're helping someone where you post it on like.com and you were helping someone show there's like a hole in their business, you know? Yeah, that, that strategy works out extremely well. Yeah. I do enough of it, but if I did it once a week, I'd probably make a lot more money. You know, so what's a bad piece? You know, talk about, you know, a good piece of advice you've gotten. What's a bad piece of advice you've received that you've found has not been true? Um, there really hasn't been a particular bad piece of advice, and I've gotten lucky on this, because advice is just advice. You don't have to take it. You can take it. You don't have to take it. It's up to you. So there's no bad piece of advice. You should always welcome advice, because you can always learn something new or learn how different people think. And you need to figure out how to filter out good advice versus bad advice. And I've been lucky on that aspect of which I've uh, mainly picked the good advice. Sometimes I've missed out on the good advice because I screen so much in which sometimes I don't take the good advice, but I always usually miss the bad advice. And sometimes I don't take opportunities. Like my buddy's like, throw money in this stock. I know you'll end up killing it. He's like, look, they have more cash on hand than what their market cap is. And then next thing you know, or he that stock shoots up Forex or another time he was like, hey, she can't take money in this real estate and they're really undervalued. They'll probably be much bigger in like three years and someone's going to gobble them up and there's going to be consolidation. And they got gobbled up and I could have got around $200,000 worth of free shares and when it sold, it probably would have been worth, I was looking at the numbers like a few months ago, I think it would have been worth three or four million bucks. But stuff like that I missed out on. So your, your filter is so strong that you, you don't get to catch the bad advice, but you miss out some of those good opportunities. That's correct. Any others that you missed out on that you kick yourself? Missed out on Airbnb as an investor. I had an option there uh, early on. Uh, there's probably a few others, but I don't really keep track of them. I don't really think about it that way because I've had enough good luck and opportunities that have come my way that I were able to capitalize on or have fun with. Yeah. You're going to miss some. You're not going to get all of them. Yeah. True. True. So what are some of the tools and systems you use daily that you find to be most helpful that other people should check out? Tools and systems that I use daily? I would say one of the big tools and systems that I use is Unroll Me. So um, have you ever heard of it? I heard about it, I think, from reading one of your blog posts, actually. So I love it. I have inbox problems. I hate that. What's that mailbox app, that Dropbox bot? Is it mailbox? I don't remember, but I know what you're talking about. 
I, I hate those kind of apps because those apps are like, remind me later to follow. If you have a lot of volume in email, that kind of shit doesn't work. Why? Because it's so inefficient to read an email, be like, remind me later to respond to it. Because then if it reminds you the next day, you got to reread it again and then respond to it. So you're wasting time. But what Unroll Me does is, I found that even though I don't subscribe to any email list, any newsletters, people add me to them somehow, hundreds of them. Oh. And then Roll Me's already unsubscribed me from over 500 and something newsletters. That's a lot, right? That saves Tons. me a lot of time. Yeah, I mean, I remember reading that and actually I immediately went to that site and I immediately started unsubscribing myself. Yeah. Yes. It's so effective. <laughs> what other ones? Obviously, Kissmetrics, Crazy Egg. What, what else should people check out? Hello Bar, although that's mine too. But I love Hello Bar, and we actually bought that one. But the reason we bought it, or Crazy Egg technically bought it, and the reason we bought it was due to the fact that we were using it on our sites, and it was helping us make so much more money from a conversion optimization standpoint. We're like, shit, this is going to be awesome. Everyone needs to have this on their site. Um, Moz is a good tool. SEO Moz, or now their name Moz. Uh, Marketo, HubSpot. HubSpot's probably a bit better. Uh, Pardot's a really good one for email marketing. We love that tool. Uh, Get Response, if you don't have much money for marketing automation, great tool. So those mm -hmm. are some of the things that we use. I have one last question for you, Neil. Appreciate your time. Before I ask it, I want you to tell us a little bit more about your business, what you're working on now that you're most excited about. So what I'm working on right now is um, it's funny, it's not as most exciting, but what I'm working on now is just expanding the marketing team at Kissmetrics, and that's kind of fun, in which we're starting to do more webinars, so we're going to do four a month now. We're trying to do more infographics and ramp it up, because we've been slow over the last year or two. And um, yeah, I think that's fun. Next week, I'm really excited because I'm releasing the definitive guide to copywriting for Quicksprout, and I'm releasing, I hope the launch timing goes well. And So next Thursday, not this Thursday, I'm also launching uh, the tool set. So I have an SEO tool that I use that helps analyze a page from speed because search and look at speed from social shares to on-page SEO and I'm going to release that for free as well. So what, what else, what other sites should people check out so people, you know, go to them? Uh, so Kissmetrics, Crazy Egg, Low Bar, and then they can find me on my blog, Quicksprout, Q-U-I-C-K-S-P-R-O-U-T dot com. I give away a ton of stuff for free. It's great. It's great stuff. Um, I have one last question, but I thought of another one, which is amazing that how do you respond to all the comments on your blog? I mean, you are amazing that there will be like 50 comments and you'll respond to almost every one of them. Yeah. So it actually doesn't take me that time, because, that much time. Because if you think about it, there's over 70,000 comments on the blog. Imagine how many of them are very similar. <laughs> and I have like templates. Think of the canned responses in Gmail. I have a lot of canned responses and then I just have to modify it to fit. Got it. So it's like that helps a lot. Because you're, you're, I mean, that definitive guide, I think like three people were like, where's the definitive guide? They really want this definitive guide that you're coming out with. Yeah. So my, my last question is, you know, you and Heaton are blunt with each other, right? <laughs> You've had three, or this is your third interview today. You do a lot of interviews, a lot of speaking engagements. I want you to give me some blunt advice. What are the good things, some constructive feedback from this interview? What, what was good? What, what do you think needs work? Sure. Be blunt so, with me. Okay, I'll be blunt with you. I like how you start off the call before we recorded going over the questions. I didn't need it myself, but I did like that. That's very helpful. I think that'll help you get more targeted feedback. Two. I'm actually scared to ask you this, but I'm, I'm asking it anyway. So go. <laughs> two, and this was my mistake. I talked too much during this interview. We should have had more of a conversation, so you should have cut me off, or I should have stopped talking, and I realized I was doing it, and I still kept going, which I shouldn't have. So I think that by creating more of a conversation, I think it would have been more engaging for the audience, and I think it would have caused the listening, li listening ship or readership or whatever you want to call it to be higher. Uh, three, and I gave this advice to Andrew Warner, use a pretty background. Uh, I don't know where you are. But you're wearing a collared shirt. I told him to always wear a collared shirt, so he puts one on. And, uh, you know, four, I would have a professional setup. I don't think you have a professional setup because you have earphones on. I would have, like, that big mic because it, like, just makes yeah. it seem I, I was thinking about putting this more in the screen because it looks professional, but... I get what you mean. So 
And what ends up happening is, is when you have those elements or like a bookshelf behind you, people will take it more seriously too, right? Mm -hmm. So um, other than that, I'll try to figure out how to make the videos higher quality. I think that's a mistake Andrew does as well. A good example of a high quality interview is Foundation with Kevin Rose. Have you seen those interviews? Sure. Superb quality, right? Like that's the kind of style you want to end up going after. I think your questions are spot on. And I think you'll end up fixing a lot of that little stuff over time. But overall, I think if I'd have rated it on a scale of 1 to 10, I think you did a 9 out of 10. Oh, There's wow. not much that you have to improve upon. Appreciate it. I was a little scared, but I was, I'm was i open to feedback, so I was excited to hear it. Yeah, so I do a lot of interviews a month. I, didn't do, I don't do three every day, right? I don't do one even every day. But today I just had three for some weird reason. So I would say out of a given month, you would probably be in the top, out of the last 30 or 60 days, you're probably the number one person who interviewed me, as in quality wise, like questions, how prepared you were, how much you knew about me, so it was All good. Right. All right, thanks Neil, I appreciate it. We'll link everything up, definitely check out Quick Sprout on the other sites. Neil, I really appreciate your time. No problem, thanks for having me.